Denmark, 1983. In the capital city of Copenhagen, an unprecedented event is about to occur. The first biker war in European history. The Hells Angels, a global superpower in the world of organized crime with chapters all across the world, have set their sights on Denmark as their next expansion target, with the eventual goal of monopolizing the entire Scandinavian drug trade. Standing in their way is an alliance of Danish bikers who resent the foreign Hells Angels encroachment into their country and have decided to band together and fight back. The two groups would clash in a destructive war that would last for over three years and lead to the deaths of 12 people as well as sowing the seeds for the eventual Great Nordic Biker War that would break out just eight years later. Our story begins in Amsterdam, 1973. A Dutchman by the name of Willem von Boxtel has big dreams of becoming the most powerful outlaw biker in Europe. Growing up in the east end of Amsterdam, Willem was a motorcycle lover and idolized the American-based Hells Angels, with him and his friends routinely regaling each other with tales of the Angels' criminal exploits in America and elsewhere in Europe. At the age of 17, Willem formed a small motorcycle gang with his friends and carved out a little slice of territory for their own in East Amsterdam. At this early stage, the gang mainly committed acts of petty crime and random violence, with one of their first acts being to rob a local convenience store and beat up the manager. When they heard that the manager had called the police, Willem and his gang showed up the next night and attacked him once again and threatened him into silence. Not long after, they stormed a nearby high school and attacked whoever got in their way, including both male and female students as well as members of the faculty, with one teacher being beaten and then pushed down a staircase. After their raid at the high school was over, Willem and his boys continued their onslaught of violence and attacked a restaurant just across the street, vandalizing the establishment and when the manager confronted the group, one of the gang members hit him over the head with a lead pipe. After the rampage, police finally caught up to Willem and his crew, arresting him and 11 others. He was charged, convicted, and sentenced to 6 weeks in prison, followed by 6 weeks probation. While in custody, Willem's ambitions only grew and he became determined to transform his gang from a small-time group of hoodlums committing petty vandalism into the most feared gang in Amsterdam while also winning the recognition and respect of his Hells Angels idols. Upon release, Willem decided that the best strategy would be to fake it till you make it, and so he started calling his gang the Hells Angels. Despite not being an official member or associated with the club in any way, shape, or form, this worked wonders as a marketing strategy, with disaffected youth from all over Amsterdam joining Willem's Angels. The group soon began experiencing a meteoric rise and Willem's influence over Amsterdam's criminal underworld steadily grew. When he heard that a biker gang from England called the Mad Dogs were coming to Amsterdam to party and potentially lay the groundwork for an expansion, he decided that he needed to send a message. And so he and his gang jumped the Mad Dogs while they were partying in a local park and savagely beat them before the fight was broken up by police. This showing of strength further bolstered Willem's reputation and led to yet more people joining his gang. This alarmed Amsterdam's municipal government, who were becoming increasingly uneasy at Willem's growing power, and so they decided to take action. Theorizing that the best way to ensure that Willem and his boys weren't out in public causing trouble would be to somehow keep them off the streets, the government ingeniously decided to grant them the necessary funds to construct their own clubhouse in the east end of the city, which came to a total cost of over 100,000 USD in today's money to Dutch taxpayers. The city council also approved an annual grant to the gang that they believed would be used to hold charity events as well as organize motorcycle training courses for young people. This grant was equivalent to over 12,000 USD in today's money. Unsurprisingly, this would prove to be a monumental mistake on the part of the government, as Willem used the money to create Angel Place, a stronghold for his gang that would soon gain an illicit reputation for drug dealing, torture, and murder. Now with his own personal fortress courtesy of the Dutch taxpayer, Willem believed that his long-held dream was finally within reach and so he contacted the Hells Angels leadership in California and applied for his gang to become an official Hells Angels chapter. Not long after, a delegation from California arrived to assess Willem and to determine whether or not his gang were Hells Angels material. The California group were later joined by angels from Germany, England, Australia, and other parts of the United States, who were all interested in the Dutch group's potential. Willem had applied to join the angels at the perfect time, as at that point there were only seven other Hells Angels chapters in Europe. 
five of which were in England, while the other two were located in Germany and Switzerland, respectively. The club had aggressive expansion plans for Europe, and intended to make the Amsterdam area the headquarters of their entire European operation. Quickly gaining control of Amsterdam was seen as critical to the Angels' plans being a success, as by that point the Netherlands had become one of the biggest drug smuggling hubs in the world and controlling the country's underworld would allow the Angels to easily flood the rest of Europe with their illicit goods. This is why Willem's club was being visited by Angels from all across the world who were there to ensure that he and his crew had what it takes for them to be included in the Angels' grand plans. Willem knew that he needed to prove himself useful, and so he began working on plans that would see the Angels expand into Denmark. He opened negotiations with some Danish bikers and tried to convince them to join the Angels, but this plan quickly became a disaster and seriously jeopardized his own attempts to join the club. As part of the negotiations, the Danish bikers came down to Amsterdam to discuss terms as well as party with the Angels. The bikers all met up at Angel Place and partied well into the night. Before long, everyone at the party was quite drunk, with some bikers even passing out on the floor. At some point during the night, a few of the Danish bikers left Angel Place and soon came back with a 19-year-old woman they had met. The group then proceeded to gang rape the woman right there in the clubhouse. Eventually, all of the bikers passed out due to heavy drinking and the woman managed to escape to a nearby subway station where she phoned her father to tell him what happened. The father immediately called police, who raided Angel Place the next day and arrested six bikers. The bikers would be convicted at trial and sentenced to only two years in prison, which they would never serve as a Dutch court instead ordered them deported back to Denmark. Despite not being in any legal trouble, Willem faced an equally serious problem as the incident served as the straw that broke the camel's back for his neighbors, who had finally reached their breaking point after years of constant disturbance coming from Angel Place, and so they formally petitioned the city council to permanently shut down the clubhouse. Such a thing happening would be devastating to Willem's chances of joining the Hells Angels, as losing the clubhouse would seriously damage his status in the eyes of the Angels' leadership and could cause them to look elsewhere for someone to spearhead their European plans. With this possibility looming over him, Willem lashed out at the neighbors, telling them, quote, We live by our own laws, one of them being that apart from our girlfriends, girls are only permitted in Angel Place for sex. When this explanation only succeeded in intensifying his opposition, Willem decided a different approach was needed and took a page out of the American Hells Angels playbook. He began donating large sums of money to local charity groups as well as purchasing large sums of toys and delivering them free of charge to local children's hospitals. The bribes worked, and soon the campaign against Angel Place lost public support and the incident at the clubhouse was largely forgotten. Four months later, in October 1978, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the call from California finally came. Willem and his club would become full-patch members of the Hells Angels, with the president of the Hamburg chapter personally presenting them with their official patches, and that night, the Hells Angels' Death's Head logo was proudly raised above Angel Place. With his long-held ambition finally being achieved, Willem wasted no time in conquering the rest of the country for the Angels, and in the subsequent years, three more chapters were established throughout the Netherlands. From his base in Amsterdam, Willem began making deals and alliances with other gangs and soon the Angels were the most powerful criminal organization in the country, due in large part to their complete dominance over the drug trade. Cocaine flew in from Colombia, heroin from Turkey, and cannabis from Morocco, all destined for the European market. But first it all had to pass through the Netherlands, making Willem and his crew obscenely wealthy. This money was then invested in creating large, underground synthetic drug laboratories throughout the Netherlands, which were soon pumping out enough product to supply not only Europe, but also North America, Asia, and Australia. With his power base in the Netherlands firmly secured and generating more money than he ever thought possible, Willem decided that the time was right to launch his long-planned invasion of Scandinavia. It was a commonly held belief amongst the Hells Angels leadership that the Scandinavian countries were ripe targets for expansion, as there was already an established biker culture and there were also hundreds of small, outlaw biker groups already operating in the area who they believed would willingly join the Angels. Willem entered into a partnership with an ambitious Danish biker named Bent Blondie Nielsen. Nielsen was the leader of a coalition of five different biker clubs with the innocent sounding name The Galloping Goose. The Galloping Goose had their operations in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, and within two years they had become full patch members and the first official Hells Angels chapter in Scandinavia. 
The expansion had happened with absolutely no violence and so on New Year's Eve 1980, the members of both the Dutch and Danish chapters met in Copenhagen and threw a massive party to celebrate. All was not well however, as not all of the small, independent biker groups in the Copenhagen area were interested in joining the Angels. These groups resented the American-based club invading their country, and since they knew that the Angels wouldn't tolerate any other biker club dealing drugs in Denmark, they decided to band together and fight back. They called themselves the Bullshit Motorcycle Club, and together they controlled a lucrative slice of the Copenhagen drug trade, particularly the highly profitable area of Freetown Christiania, which was an abandoned military base in Copenhagen that had been taken over by squatters in the early 1970s. The area soon evolved to become an independent commune and was declared by its residents to be a self-governing state with its own social services and was separated from the rest of Copenhagen by highly colorful and graffitied walls. Drugs were also openly sold on the streets and out of coffee shops, and Christiania soon became a major tourist destination with thousands of visitors arriving every year. The bullshit ruled the area with an iron fist and routinely threatened and harassed members of the community. Police estimated that they also sold over $150,000 worth of weed every single day. The Angels were determined on monopolizing the entire Scandinavian biker scene and so they intended to completely destroy the bullshit, which would send a strong message to all of the rest of the independent biker groups in Scandinavia. You're either with the Angels or you're against them. The war officially began in late 1983 when Blondie Nielsen received a call from one of his spies that three bullshit members were eating at a Copenhagen restaurant that was directly in Angel's territory. Seeing this as a deliberate provocation, Blondie and four other Angels went to the restaurant armed with knives and attacked. Blondie personally killed two of the men while the third was seriously injured but managed to escape. Despite this brazen act of public violence, the bullshit were not intimidated, and retaliated over the next week with numerous drive-by shootings at Hells Angels clubhouses. No one was killed in these attacks, but the Angels decided to strike back hard by ordering the assassination of the bullshit's president, a biker nicknamed the Mackerel. A Hells Angels member then stole a parked van off the street and parked it outside the Mackerel's house and waited. As the Mackerel left his house one night and began walking towards his car, the Angels struck. Jeg sender en salve på 5-6 skud hen mod midten af vognen, og jeg mener, jeg rammer ham. Han rører i hvert fald. Og så løber jeg rundt omkring døren, og der hænger han halvvejs ud af døren, og der tømmer han maskinpistolen i ham. Og han er død. Og det er meget brutalt, men sådan slår man folk ihjel. The Mackerel was quickly replaced as president, but almost as quickly the new leader met the same fate as he was gunned down by the Angels just a couple of weeks later. 38-year-old Anker Marcus was chosen as the club's third president, and like his predecessors, his tenure wouldn't last long. On December 21st, 1985, Marcus was having a drink at a tavern his gang owned when three men in jogging outfits entered the establishment and opened fire, killing Marcus as well as an innocent bystander. The bullshit soon struck back when member Panic Peter fatally shot a Hells Angels member in the throat at a restaurant in Copenhagen. Peter was immediately arrested at the scene, but was miraculously cleared of all charges when a jury ruled that he had acted in self-defense as he was under, quote, fear and agitation from seeing a Hells Angels member due to all of the recent killings that the Angels had orchestrated. By 1986, the bullshit were on the ropes, with two more of their members being swiftly killed by the Angels. First was Jan Sonberg, who was shot execution style just outside the Bullshit's clubhouse by a Hells Angels prospect as part of his initiation. Not long after, another Bullshit member was assassinated while he was delivering beer to a Bullshit-owned bar. By 1988, the Bullshit had lost so many members that they were barely able to function, and so, seeing no other options, Jan Linda, the fourth and final Bullshit MC president, personally phoned the Hells Angels clubhouse in Copenhagen and officially surrendered, saying, quote, We have sold the clubhouse and burned our vests. The war is over. In total, 12 people had died, including 8 members of the Bullshit, 1 Hells Angel, and 3 innocent people who were unfortunately caught up in the crossfire. Commenting on the violence, a commander with the Copenhagen police would tell the media, quote, They eliminated the Bullshit totally. They killed everybody. After that, the Hells Angels were alone in the Danish criminal scene and in the Nordic scene as well. 
With the first Nordic Biker War ending in a crushing victory for the Angels, they were now the undisputed masters of Europe. With the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, the United Kingdom, France, Switzerland, and Austria all boasting strong Hells Angels chapters unrivaled by any other group. Unbeknownst to the Angels, however, an old adversary was looking at their European conquest with envy, and soon a much deadlier foe would make their presence felt. 